and Anita Anand. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's um, lovely once again to see so many people gathered to hear such a great speaker here at the Jaipur Literary Festival. And you are in for such a treat, I can't tell you. Um, Michael Sandal, many of you will know, is uh, the professor of government at Harvard University, where he teaches political philosophy. And more than that, he's been described as a rock star moralist. Now, I'll explain a little more about that. And it's a very appropriate term. I, I work for the BBC. I work with a cynical bunch of journalists. Nothing much really impresses them, except one day I did turn up for work and one of my producers had gone to hear Michael recording one of his programs for the radio station that I work for. And she was so flushed with delight and excitement, I was trapped on a two-hour journey where all she would talk about is Michael Sandel this, Michael Sandel that. It was the intellectual equivalent of he is such a dreamboat. And so when magazines call him, uh, and I'll just quote some of the things that he has been described as, perhaps the most prominent college professor in America, the most relevant living philosopher, they really ain't joking, and I'll tell you, the numbers don't lie. Um, Michael very recently played to a 2,000-strong audience at St. Paul's Cathedral. That's quite impressive. You can clap that, I would. Okay, that's nothing. Wait for this. Uh, in Seoul, in Korea, he played to 14,000 people. And that's in an outdoor stadium, and that is to hear a man talk about philosophy. That is unusual, to say the least. Michael's writings have been translated into 21 languages. His legendary course, Justice, uh, I think many of you are probably students and you will have seen this, because it has been made available online, and millions have logged on and watched that lecture series. Um, he was named, and this I find really intriguing actually, because you were named the most influential foreign figure of the year in China. So the reach of this man is, is extraordinary. And the reason Michael is here, I can share a little secret um, today, is because you know William Dalrymple is the organizer of this great event. Uh, his young son heard Michael speak at his school and said, you've just got to book this man, Dad. You've got to get him on. You've got to get him on. And that's what I think is exceptional, that it's a reach across continents, it's a reach across generations. And the reason is that Michael asks the most extraordinary questions. So this series of, of lectures, or this lecture that you're going to hear today, is what money can't buy, the moral limit of markets. And I'm glad the word moral is there, because if it wasn't, people would say there are no limits to the markets. They're just unstoppable. But Michael grapples with questions like, should we pay children to do better at school? Should we give them cash for grades? Is it ethical to pay people to test risky new drugs or donate their organs? Is that the way to source um, perhaps goodness in people if you flash the cash? What about outsourcing inmates for profit prisons? Those kind of questions. They're really thorny, they're really tricky, and Michael isn't scared of them. And um, so it is with great delight that I call on Michael to speak. It's going to be a really exciting interactive session. So Michael's going to be throwing some questions out to you. And then when he's finished, we're going to have a, a more traditional Q&A afterwards. So please put your hands together for the rock star philosopher who is Mr. Michael Sandel. Well, thank, thank you, Anita, for that very generous introduction that I can't possibly live up to. The subject that I teach is, is philosophy. And the kind of philosophy that interests me, political philosophy, is not some abstract set of ideas that have no relation to our lives. What interests me is to look at our public life in societies, all of our societies, and try to make sense of it. If you look at what passes for political discourse these days, in democratic societies around the world, it's not a pretty picture. There's enormous frustration with the way we do politics. And this is true in most democracies. It's true in my country, it's true in the UK, it's true here in India. And I think the reason for the frustration with democracy 
in democratic societies, the frustration with our public discourse is that it is largely empty, hollowed, hollowed out, impoverished. It doesn't really address the big questions that matter. And one of the reasons it doesn't is that we tend to shy away from controversial moral questions, questions about justice, about the meaning of the good society. And we shy away from those questions for an understandable reason. Because people disagree when it comes to matters of justice and ethics and virtue and the good life. People have different moral and sometimes religious ideas about those concepts. And so we try, wrongly I think, we try to avoid tangling with one another about controversial big moral questions in politics. And I think this is a mistake. I think it's a mistake that has been abetted by a growing reliance on markets and market thinking over the past three decades. And that really brings me to the subject of my new book and the subject I would like to discuss with you here today. The book is about really a simple question. And the question is this, what role should money and markets play in a good society? These days, there are very few things that money can't buy. If you are ever sentenced to a jail term in Santa Barbara, California, just in case that ever happens to you, you should know that if you don't like the standard accommodations in the jail, you can buy a prison cell upgrade. You didn't know that? For how much do you suppose? Anita, what do you think it costs per night? Um, in a prison, I would hope no more than maybe $15? Well, it's $80. It's $80. Okay, surprise. Take another example. In Washington, D.C., if you want to attend a congressional hearing but don't want to stand in the very long queue, sometimes overnight if it's a popular hearing, you can go to a company called linestanding.com and they will, you, will pay, you can pay them and they will hire a line stander to stand in the line for you overnight if need be. You pay by the hour and just before the hearing begins you can arrive, take your place at the head of the line and go into the hearing room. Now Take another kind of example. Suppose you want to make some money, maybe to hire a line stander yourself. And you don't have a regular job. There are now growing opportunities to make money. One of them is offered by advertising companies that will pay you to hire out space on your body to carry a commercial advertising, tattoo advertising, forehead advertising, uh, because forehead is prime space for commercials. There was one advertising executive in London who was asked about this practice, tattoo advertising. He said, well, it's like the old sandwich board, but a bit more organic. One woman needed money for the education of her child and she auctioned off space on her forehead with permanent, permanent tattoo for $10,000. Unfortunately, the company that bought the space was an online casino. So the rest of her days, she will be advertising this online casino on her forehead. Well, these may seem like small and fanciful examples. But it's true of big institutions as well. In Iraq and Afghanistan, in those wars, there were more paid military contractors on the ground 
than there were U.S. military troops. Now, this is not because we ever had a public debate about whether we wanted to outsource war to private companies with hired soldiers, but gradually, by degrees, over the past few decades, this is what has happened. In fact, if you step back and look at the unfolding of this trend, you'll see that the past three decades have brought a quiet revolution. In many of our countries, we have drifted, almost without realizing it, from having market economies to becoming market societies. The difference is this. A market economy is a tool. It's a valuable and effective tool for organizing productive activity. And it's also an effective tool very often for breaking through encrusted, unresponsive bureaucracies and state agencies. So market economies can be very valuable provided we use them as tools. But market societies are different. A market society is a place where everything is up for sale. A market society is a way of life in which market thinking and market values begin to reach into every domain of life, including domains such as family life, community life, health, education, civic life, law, criminal justice. And often, when market values come to dominate these areas of non-material goods in social practices, they may crowd out, even corrupt, important non-market values worth caring about. Take an example that's related to what we gather here today to celebrate, books. Now, books have always been commodities in a sense. You can't walk into the bookstore and just walk out with the book. You have to pay for it. So a book is a market good in a way, but it's not a thoroughgoing market good. It embodies other values. Consider product placement. Product placement is familiar from, from the movies and uh, from television. Paid product placement, but not in books, at least not traditionally. Not too long ago, a British novelist called Faye Weldon, have you heard of her, Faye Weldon? She made a deal with an Italian jewelry company to write a novel in which she would mention the name of the jewelry company, Bulgari, at least a dozen times in exchange for a payment. The title of the book, aptly enough, was The Bulgari Connection. She actually exceeded the required number of product placement mentions. She mentioned Bulgari in the novel 34 times. Some critics complained about the clunkiness of the product-laden prose. Here's an example. Do you want to hear what this book said? Well, here, here's an example. Quote, A Bulgari necklace in the hand is worth two in the bush, said Doris. Or this, quote, they snuggled together happily for a bit, all passion spent, and she met him at Bulgari that lunchtime. <laughs> now, fortunately, product placement in books hasn't really caught on. But I suspect that with the advent of electronic publishing, the experience of reading will come in closer and closer contact with commercial advertising. Last year, Amazon issued a new version of its Kindle. There are now two versions of the Kindle that you can buy. One of them is the standard Kindle. The other is exactly the same, but it's $40 less. The only catch, you have to be willing to put up with running ads, commercial ads, on the home page and on the screensaver. Now, why should we care? Why should we care if we find ourselves drifting 
from having market economies to becoming market societies. Why should we care about living in societies where everything is up for sale? Well, the reason we should care is that in certain domains of life, market values can be corrosive. They can crowd out important non-market values worth caring about. Now, often, it's not uncontroversial whether important non-market values are being crowded out by markets and whether that represents a moral cost worth caring about. But consider material goods. With material goods, the buying and selling, this is an assumption familiar among economists, the idea is that buying and selling goods doesn't change the value of the goods being exchanged. If you sell me a flat screen television, or if you give me one as a gift, the television will work just the same either way. The buying and selling doesn't change the meaning or the value of the good. But the same may not be true if we're talking about health, education, family life, civic life, law, and the rest. I'd like to put to you an example. We'll have in a discussion here in this intimate setting an example, let me pose it as a hypothetical case. Let's suppose you're the head of a school. And many of the students in the school struggle academically. Maybe they're from disadvantaged backgrounds. And you're trying to find a way to motivate them, to study harder, to read more books, to spend more time with their academic pursuits. An economist comes to you and says, well, incentives work. Here's a small pot of money. What you can do with it is you can provide financial incentives to these students to get good grades, to get high test scores, even to read books. Now, this isn't purely hypothetical. I want to hear your view about it, whether you would accept this proposal and I expect people will disagree. It's not purely hypothetical, though, I should tell you, because in many U.S. school districts in major cities, they are trying this. In New York, they offer $50 for an A, $35 for a B. In Chicago, in Washington, D.C., they've tried this. In Dallas, Texas, they offer young children, eight-year-olds, $2 for each book they read. So here's our... Here's our question for discussion. And let's see what people think. First, by a show of hands. If you were the head of the school, how many would say, well, this may be worth a try, at least? How many would be in favor, at least, of trying cash for good grades or reading books? And how many disagree? How many would not favor this? Well, the majority are against, including Anita. But a substantial minority think it would be worth a try, so let's begin with them. Those who would favor this plan, or at least consider it worth trying, let me hear from someone who can begin our discussion, and we've got some microphones, we'll try to get to you. Why would you, why would you go for it? Please, stand up, we'll get you a microphone. Stand up and tell us your name, and why you would go for the cash for good grades. Hello, my name is Malaika and I recently graduated from school and in our school we actually had a system of awards, academic awards and other awards and this took, uh, this took place after the exams had happened, the results had come out and you had awards such as the person who got first place in, an, in each subject, you had people who got academic excellence for getting above a certain percentage, you also had awards like lateral thinking and progress for students who may not have achieved as much as the others, but in terms of their own um, progress, they right. had made it. And let me ask you about the awards. Uh, it Did was the book awards vouchers. Book vouchers. Vouchers. And where could the vouchers be redeemed? Um, a bookstore, a specific bookstore. A bookstore. Aha. So that's a little bit different from cash, or is it? It isn't. 
Because my brother used to give me the book vouchers and I used to pay him the money. <laughs> Market reasoning. And did, did, you, did you win any vouchers yourself? Yes. yes. And you sold them to your brother? No, he didn't read much. <laughs> and so if you were the, now you're the head of the school. You, by the way, how many books did you get out of this deal? Uh, they were vouchers, so it depended on how, how, how much the book cost. Right, but Quite about. a few, quite a few actually. Quite a few, so you did very well. I think so. <laughs> now, so y you as the head of the school would use a similar system. Why, uh, not, why not pay cash outright? Why, why stick with vouchers? Well, cash outright might not even be that bad an idea if you okay. consider it in terms of you might want to help your parents out if you have a financial situation at home. Right. If you okay. have an incentive and you have a, you know, an outlet where it's not legal for you to be working right. because you're under the age of 18, but you can still provide for your family. Good, so, okay. So, wait, tell me your name again. Malaika. Malaika, all right. Malaika, stay there. Keep the microphone. I want to hear from someone who disagrees with Malaika, who would reject the scheme of paying kids to get good grades. Um, let's see, and where the people with the microphones, wave your hand so I can see. All right, you've Hello. got someone back Hello. there? Okay, go ahead. Tell us your name. Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Professor? Actually, I can hear you. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to say that creativity and divergent thinking is a very important issue when we are talking about education and all this because it is just not driven by some money or some incentive which we want to give because there is a term mastery and autonomy which actually makes the person more creative and divergent so that new things can come up and innovativeness well wait 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 study. let me ask you if i understand your objection so you would not pay money to no. students no because you think it would diminish or suffocate their creativity Actually, why, yeah. why would it? Why would it? Why can't someone be creative and be paid for it? Because it may sometimes mm, block the person's idea to think more divergently because he wants to score A, so he will follow the channel A. He won't follow channel B or C or think other way so that he can find answer. All right, thank you for that. What's your name? Sagar. Okay, Malaika. I think you should change an education system where you have to write A to get the marks. If you write well, if you are creative enough, you should get the marks. You're oh. talking about a situation where you need to write in a particular way and sacrifice your creativity. That shouldn't be the case in the education system. All right, so you should have a, a crea a, a, an education system that prizes creativity, but when people do well, pay them. Pay them to be creative thinkers. All right. Who else disagrees? Who else objects? Uh, professor, this side. Uh, uh, professor? Okay, I have a here. small point. Uh, a small point, but I want big points here. Okay. We'll just make it a little bigger in that case. All right. Uh, the money that is received, how sure are we that that will not go into activities which are not desirable? Uh, well, uh, wait, 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 yeah. wait. Is that an argument against paying people for work? No, I'm just saying you're talking school kids. School kids. Talking about school kids, right? Yes. School kids. Will misspend the money. They may. What will they spend it on, do you think? Cigarettes. Cigarettes. Drugs. So you wouldn't pay children ever for any reason. That is not the case. The, the point remains, the point no. remains, the, po yeah, the point remains that aren't we giving them too much discretion by paying them money? All right, what about the book vouchers? I think that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a better way of doing things because at least you know where the, the financial incentive is going. But suppose they do as <laughs> Malaika's brother did and sold off the book vouchers for money and then bought cigarettes. Then in that case, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to subvert any, any policy that you can put in. I'm just okay. saying that... Right. Yeah, that, that, that could that's be a, a difficulty. That's a secondary subversion minus the primary subversion. All right, I see the force of that. <laughs> All right. Who, are there others... Are there people who object in, in principle to this idea? Um, yes. Can we Hi. get a microphone over here? All right, go ahead. Yes. You, you're not actually... If you're paying children to 
pass exams. You're not then looking at the underlying reason. Why are they failing? Why are the schools failing them? You need to look at the system that is in place and, and the teachers, the culture around them. Why, why are they failing? What has failed? Right, so it will distract um, so from other reforms, you think? All yeah. right, who else? So I want to hear. I have a microphone. All yeah. right. So um, I think if you pay someone to learn, you're defeating the purpose of going to school. Right, because you're putting a price on education, on uh, learning. So, I don't think kids would really use the proper means, or they would actually have a conducive environment to learn. Okay, well, wait. Pressure. I want to ask you. Tell us your name. Sakshi. Sakshi. Yes, sir. I want to ask you a question about that. Paying kids to read books or to get good grades defeats the purpose of going to school. What is the proper purpose of going to school? So I think you go to school to learn, to, um, yeah, I mean, it, cheesy as it may sound, to gain knowledge, right? But, uh, so I don't, I mean, I'm specifically talking about how things work in India. If you rot learn a thing and reproduce it in your answer sheet, you sort of get full marks for that. And that doesn't necessarily amount to learning. All right, so well, we've heard the, the worry about rote learning yeah. and the lack of creative learning, but I want to come back to the matter of paying. Suppose that it was not. Keep the microphone for a minute. I want to ask you about this. Defeating, you think that paying money defeats, somehow defeats the activity or undermines the activity of learning. What do you say to the argument that students may read more books, may study harder, and the money would promote the purpose of school, which is learning. Why wouldn't it, do you think? I don't think uh, something as, I mean, um, uh, putting a monetary value on uh, reading and trying to gain knowledge is actually the solution. But uh, why? I I'm, trying to, yeah. I'm trying to understand why you think that. Uh, so, okay, so, the thing is that you, uh, I mean, people would uh, go to the end and not the means to get there. I see. And yeah. so they would, well, so actually in the, I should mention, so they would, they would focus on the means, they would want to try to make money, and they would miss the larger end of learning, yeah, which, I, which is what exactly? <laughs> so I think schools uh, should breed as, Somebody said breed creativity and yes. individuality yes. and you're sort of uh, compartmentalizing and putting people in pigeonholes by putting a man monetary value. You are giving but them But we do give them grades. Yeah, so Some say grades put them in pigeonholes. So no? Uh, test yeah, scores? I don't think so. I okay. know test scores are something right, that So why is the money corrosive of the larger purpose? The end of learning. That's, that's getting us on to some yes. important terrain. Is there someone else? Who, who would like to speak to that issue? I yeah. would. I would. I have. Okay. I, I, that's what I've been wanting to say. I'm a 38-year veteran of uh, edu education. I'm a teacher. I was a teacher in the American schools, and this idea seemed morally repugnant to me. Morally repugnant. D in the past tense, did seem morally repugnant to oh, me. Oh, it seemed. Yes, seemed that way when uh, I was approached by it uh, some years ago. And then I saw a documentary, The Name Escapes Me Now, where they followed some uh, high school students in, I believe, Detroit. Can you give me the name of that? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Okay, well, it, it, it was a documentary that followed the children who were paid. Children, I should say, adolescents. Right. Uh, and high, what happened? They were in high poverty schools. Right. They were uh, uh, what we call students in danger. They're students in danger of dropping out. And I walked away from that experience a cha with a changed attitude because I saw those children motivated to stay in school. And by the an money. They were motivated by the money? Absolutely. And the, uh, you know, people talk grandly about all the aims of education, but if we don't have the kids in the seats, we have nothing. We have no way to improve that system. So you feel it worked when you saw this documentary. It worked to motivate Absolutely. the kids. Absolutely. It kept them in school. And more importantly, it kept the parents involved in their kids' education. The parents played a very, they had to sign papers and they had to meet twice a semester about grades. Okay. And it was All very right, innovative. So, all right. So we do need to pay attention to this question about whether it excuse, excuse works. Me, excuse me, sir. Here, here. All right. If a person is somebody who belongs to a blaze and 
belongs to a blazer and he is in a poor condition. He got good grade in his studies. So what bad if he got his, in the, the, that money in the form of a scholarship? Aha, uh -huh. so what about we do give scholarships, that's invol that involves money. Well, it's money in a way, but it's so sort of like a voucher. Yeah. It's sort of like a voucher because the scholarship can't if, be spent on cigarettes. It can only be spent at the school. Sir, 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 if the person is not able to pay his fees to that university or the college or right. the school, right. then how can he spend his money on his uh, cigarette or drugs right. whatsoever? Right, right. He has to use it to pay for the fees. See, sir, as we are from India and if, we, if you go towards the Indian blazes, they don't think about the cigarette. They think about ba three basic things, food, shelter, okay. and cloths. All right, good. Yes. Hello. Yeah. So I actually think the idea could backfire because essentially you're trading money uh, for the guilt of not studying. So if you pay me money for studying, what's stopping me from actually not studying because that way I just don't get paid and maybe I don't want the money. It might have a perverse incentive effect. All right. Uh, so so it's been I pointed out. It's all right. One more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the objection to financial incentives oh, to sir. the people who score. Yes. Uh, if I'm the head of the school, I look at it this way. If there are two to three people I am paying just because they scored the highest marks, yes. what happens in the long run is that I am giving resources to these people to study better who already studied better. And the people who are not performing well, I'm not giving them extra resources to study harder now. Right. So what I'm taking away is the resources from these people, especially applies but to the all right, But I have a solution to that problem. What about paying students for improvement from how well they did last year? Is that all right? For improvement, like... Over their own performance last year. Whoever improves gets paid. Uh, but... No, uh, again. If they don't improve, if somebody is not performing well, yes. I will pay him only if he improves. But how will he improve? I need to give him resources in general. More than just the payment. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello. Yes, where are you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yes, turn Good the evening. back. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, my hal name is... Hello. <laughs> no, it's hard. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Apra Kuchal and we were part of this team in St. Austell, Cornwall, uh, wherein, uh, you know, there the attendance problem was a lot and children wouldn't turn up to study. And the moment they started uh, this paying, you know, the way they rewarded, uh, they realized the attendance really kind of improved and many children wanted to come and study. They didn't want to study because they thought that you know, it was not a fashion or probably their friends didn't want to attend classes. Right. So the improvements uh, in grades, improvements in attendance, in fact, the improvement in the overall education system in St. Austell took place after they started the rewarding system. So it system. worked, it worked. It did. And you'd it be in favor of it. Yes, okay. absolutely. All right, so we do need, it's been pointed out in the discussion, and I know there are a lot of other people who want to contribute, but let me see if I can say, make some observations about what we've heard and what we've learned. A number of people have said that if it works, if it works, that's a reason to overcome our hesitation, the hesitation of many of you, to pay the kids. Do you want to know actually what happened in these cases? In New York City, the money did not cr lead to higher grades. In Dallas, Texas, the two dollars for each book did lead those kids to read more books. It also led them to read shorter books. But the larger question, the larger question that I think is on many people's minds, those of you who object, is what will become of these kids later when the money stops? Will they carry on reading or will the money have taught them a lesson at odds with the larger purposes of education? Will the money teach them that reading is a chore to be done for pay rather than something to be done for the love of it? That's the question. And so this goes in a way to this question about means and ends. What is our goal? What is our purpose? And I was pressing uh, 
the, the speaker before, what is the purpose of education? That's not an easy thing to answer. Yeah. But surely the purpose of education is not simply to maximize the number of books students read, though it's good that they read more rather than fewer. Really, the ultimate purpose is to inculcate a love of reading and learning for their own sake. And so one objection, or worry at least, about cash for reading books or getting good grades is that the money may teach the wrong lesson, cultivate the wrong attitudes, and crowd out the intrinsic love of reading or learning. A friend of mine pays his young children one dollar for each thank you note they write when they've been taken out to dinner or given a gift. I've received some of these thank you notes and I can tell by reading them that they were written under a certain pressure. My wife and I look askance at this practice of paying kids to write thank you notes. We wonder how these kids will turn out. Now it could be that by being paid to write thank you notes they will get in the habit of writing thank you notes and eventually learn the real reason for writing them. In which case when the money stops they'll keep writing thank you notes out of gratitude and all will be well. That could happen. But it could also turn out that by paying these kids for thank you notes this parent is teaching the kids the thank you notes are a chore to be done for pay, in which case, if that's the lesson they learn, when the money stops, so will the thank you notes. They will never learn the virtue of gratitude and their moral education will be corrupted. It's hard to know in advance, but it's a question that we have to ask of every use of market mechanisms or financial incentives in non-material domains. Some years ago in Switzerland, they were trying to decide where to locate a nuclear waste site. No community wants one in its backyard. The, under the law, the community had to agree to accept the waste site. There was a small town in the mountains of Switzerland that was identified as probably the safest place. But before the parliament actually decided, some a survey was done of the residents of the town and they were asked if your town is chosen will you vote to approve the nuclear waste site 51 percent despite the risk said yes then they asked a follow-up question they sweetened the deal they said suppose your town is chosen and parliament votes to give financial compensation to each resident of the town a yearly amount up to eight thousand dollars a year then would you agree to have the nuclear waste site here now how many do you suppose agreed what would you guess 85 percent 65 how many do you think Anita no, I'd say it'd go up maybe 65 70, 65 so? 70 100 yeah. 20? It went down? It did go down. It dropped from 51% to 25%. Now from the standpoint of standard economic reasoning, this is a paradox. Because according to standard economic reasoning, if you offer to pay people to do something, you will get a greater willingness to do that thing, not less. So what happened here? What happened that seems to confound standard economic reasoning? Does someone have a quick explanation? What? So what? Go ahead, say it. Uh, people probably figured out that they were being put in danger. People realized when the money was offered that they were being put in grave danger. So, oh, if you're willing to pay me all that money, this must really be bad. Well. That's one good hypothesis, but they tested for that. They asked people to estimate the risk that this thing involved, and the estimate of the risk before and after the financial offer were about the same. So there must be some other explanation. What else might have been going on here? Anybody? I think, uh, what, my name is Simmer. I, you mentioned that this is a principle of economics that uh, if you pay somebody to do something, then they would, 
it's in their interest to do it. But I think you're not quite right when it comes to this is because uh, according to the principles of insurance, uh, it's also true that a person has infinite insurable interest in oneself. So if you're parking radioactive waste in my background, I mean, uh, it's causing danger to my health and uh, $8,000 per year, I might have cancer and I might have to pay $16,000 a year for my treatment. So, but the I, question, but the question is, why did they change? Why were they less willing to accept it when they were offered money? Simply they, because uh, the money, whatever I was being offered, I don't know whether I would have to pay much higher in terms of medical but that, bills. But that risk was present when they were offering no money at all, and more people were willing to accept that the risk then. Because so what? What else? They, they actually asked the people who changed their minds, why did you change your mind when the money was offered? And they said, we didn't want to be bribed. We didn't want to be bribed. See, when, when, the, when the majority was willing, in the first case, without money, to accept it, they knew it represented a risk. But they considered that this was, they did it out of a sense of, of civic responsibility. The country needed the energy. This was seen to be the safest place to store it. They were willing to bear that risk for the sake of the common good. But when money was offered, that changed the nature of the transaction, the character of the deal. Now it was what, what began as a question of public responsibility, of the common good, of civic virtue, now was a financial transaction. And they weren't willing to sell out the safety and security of themselves and their families for money. So the, care, the offer of money change the character of the good in much the way that some of you worried that offering students money to read would change the character of the activity, making it a form of paid labor rather than learning for the love of it. There were some daycare centers, nursery schools in Israel that faced a familiar problem. Parents coming late to pick up their children so with the help of some economists, the daycare centers instituted a fine for late arrivals. What do you suppose happened? More parents arrived late. Here again, from the standpoint of standard economic reasoning, this is surprising. Because if you impose a fine, fewer people will carry on coming late. So what happened? Well, in line with the examples we've been discussing, the meaning of arriving late changed. Before, parents felt guilty when they came late. They were imposing a burden on a teacher who had to stay and look after the children. But now, when there was a monetary payment for a late arrival, they considered that they were buying a service. They were paying for a service, like hiring a babysitter. And so the sense of responsibility to show up on time was dissolved, was crowded out by the monetary payment. What, what each of these examples suggests is that as markets and financial incentives reach into spheres of life governed by non-market norms, there is always the possibility that the money and the market thinking will change attitudes, crowd out non-market values by changing the meaning of the goods at stake. What, if this is true, there are two important conclusions that follow. First, we have to change the way we think about economics and the way we teach it. Because in recent decades, Economics presents itself, and we teach it to young people, as a value-neutral science of social choice. But if sometimes introducing markets and market mechanisms changes the meaning of goods and crowds out important values, then it's a mistake to think that economics alone, considerations of economic efficiency, can tell us where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong. 
So one conclusion, I think, is that we need to reconnect economics with an older tradition of moral and political economy. If you go back to Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx, for all their differences, they understood economics to be a subfield of moral and political philosophy. And I think we need to go back to that. The second conclusion is about the character of our public discourse, which is where we began. I think one of the reasons our public discourse has become so hollowed out, so emptied of larger moral questions more in recent decades, is that we have outsourced moral and political judgment to markets and to market reasoning. It's tempting to do so. Market reasoning presents itself as value neutral. It seems to spare us hard public arguments and debates about how to value goods in the area of family life or education or health care or civic life or military service. It seems to spare us those hard debates. And politicians and political parties love to avoid hard debates, but so do we as citizens. But if it's true that the extension of markets into non-material domains of social life change the meaning of social practices, then to decide where markets belong and where they don't, we need to reason together. We need to do the hard work of democratic citizenship to argue together, to reason together about the meaning of goods and social practices. I think it's no accident that the impoverishment of public discourse in recent decades has come at the same time that market reasoning, a kind of market triumphalism, has come to the, to the fore. So it's understandable why we shrink from these debates. But shrinking from moral and even spiritual questions in public life does not leave these questions undecided. It simply means that markets will decide these questions for us. This is the lesson of the last three decades. Our only hope of keeping markets in their place is to deliberate openly and publicly about the meaning of the goods and social practices we prize. And so the question, in the end, the question of markets is not only or even mainly an economic question. It's really a question about how we want to live together. Do we want a society where everything is up for sale? Or are there certain moral and civic goods that markets do not honor and money cannot buy? Thank you very much. Thanks. Michael, that was um, uh, everything that I, I thought it would be and so much more. Thank you very, very much. And, and I hope you agree that um, what a startling array of young, incisive minds we have here listening to you. Some of those points were, were brilliantly made. This is your chance now to put questions to Michael. Um, no money will change hands, <laughs> you in the front. Um, so if you could please just wait for a microphone to come to you, stand up and I'll, I'll point to you. Okay, so the first person is going to be right at the back. Could you stand up for me in the green top? Yes, if you, in the beard, if you'd like to ask your question. Great. Uh, Michael, just in the context of what you have said, how would you place piracy and the counter-market movement? Say, uh, especially if it's um, couched in terms of moral good of uh, people, sharing of information. Let's take Aaron Swartz's uh, example. Private, privacy in the sharing of information? Piracy, piracy, software piracy, copyright infringement. I see. Well, I, I think th this is one of the, the great controversial questions, especially now with um, online access to information and to databases. I think we need a revolution in the, in the way we think about intellectual property and piracy. Um, and I think that we, uh, we need to democratize access to information. 
there has to be a certain uh, there have to be certain safeguards to protect the creative work of artists and and writers and yet i think that we should expand the notion of fair use so that the creative process can extend to those who want to draw on what's on, on information but also on creative and literary works that have gone before some of the great literary creations borrow from uh, already existing ones and so I would I'm in general in favor of relaxing and reforming the strictures on intellectual property rights that we have today let's take the question the gentleman with the turban over there and if you could keep your questions short I'd really yes. appreciate it. we could get more in and then there's a young lady right there and I'd like her to be the next question please okay, okay. the young lady there okay so first of all you sir yeah Michael my name is Rajat um, Rajat Tandon and uh, you know when you talked about initially that market is a form of tool it's um, and, and especially when you took it to the school and how whether money should be used in school or not to incentivize children my question uh, or a way of looking mark, uh, at market is it's a tool not only looking at market with a transaction so could, could you ask the question okay. just just ask the question okay. very briefly if you okay. will please and raise what the mic a little higher then we can hear you thank you what do you have to say that money is an incentive given to the people who need it so market is a way of finding out what is needed and how it could be provided to children now in Maslow's hierarchy well what's needs your it question to say. sir I'm sorry I'm gonna have to push you otherwise I'll have to go to somebody yes. else if you, if you if you just ask the question in the next sentence otherwise please if, so you, if we, we just move down th Thank there you. could be ways of incentivizing people and monetary incentivization is only one form and teaching children the form of intrinsic motivation is perhaps too early for them to realize it. And markets could lead to getting the right kind of incentive to the right kind of people if markets are used properly. Okay, User. thank you very much. Thank Hi, you. Professor. Um, this side, just, India. Just one second. First sure. of all, up the lady over here. And, and just wait until I point you. That would be lovely. Thank you. Yes, over here. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to ask about the market of organ donation. Yeah. Even that is considered as a m uh, under the spectrum of uh, morally repugnant markets. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Should we change our mindset or should we not incentivize that? Because it also serves a larger purpose. Right. Like a larger purpose. Right. Most countries, most yeah. countries, it's true, ban hmm. a free market in organs, in right. human organs. Right. Although we know there is a black market in organs. That's right. I think there are two objections. I mean, the argument for allowing a market in organs is that it will increase the supply. That's the argument in favor. There are two arguments against that have to be met before we can try to increase the supply through a, through a market. One of them, how voluntary, how free is the choice if those who sell the organs are doing so out of economic desperation, living in crushing poverty. Is that truly a voluntary exchange? Or is there coercion built in to the dire necessity of their condition? That's one uh, objection. And the second is, do we want to encourage uh, people to regard our bodies as collection of spare parts and instruments of profit? Or does that commodify the human person? It's n this is not an easy question, but those are the two challenges, I think, one would have to meet before legalizing organ sales. Well, could take a question from here, and if somebody could get the, uh, the gentleman there with the blue sweatshirt, light blue sweatshirt. Do you want to stand up and uh, Mike will come to you next? Stand up and you'll be next. Okay, and first you, though. Thank Sir, you. I'm Sanjay. And uh, first of all, my objection to uh, not paying for reading is that where it is going to stop that? It may continue for going to toilet. It may continue for eating the meals. So my objection to that, that everything should not be commodified for the children. Otherwise, they'll be made very competitive at a very young age. Right. I, I would hope, I, I know there, it's often true that school meals are such that you may have to pay people to eat them. But otherwise, I'm not sure why one would have to. But yes, I see the force of it. Okay, and one more thing, one more thing. Very briefly, now, sir, very, very briefly. quickly, very quickly. That's yeah. the question, that's the question. Don't you think that economic disparity also makes a point while money is offered? Because in a country like India, the most important democratic duty of voting is being purchased. At 100 rupees, you purchase the vote. 
So, if somebody offers me 100 rupee Switzerland, what happened in Switzerland might be my response to that. Yes. But if yes. something happens for a very poor person, he's ready to vote for that. Right. What do you think about it? Right. Well, I think, think that the issue of inequality is one of the great issues that looms in the background of the objections to marketizing everything. Because the more things that money can buy outside the material domain, the harder life becomes, the, the more money matters, and the harder life becomes for those who have very little of it. And when money can buy votes, then even the voice in the political process is uh, uh, traded away conceivably by those who are most in need of it and most in need of help. Let's yes. take the gentleman with the pink shirt and the blue thing on top. Yes, please. Yes, you. Yes, yes. you. Yeah. Thing uh, see, wasn't a good see, description. I'm sorry. The point yeah. is, okay. uh, one is this uh, earlier question has an assumption that uh, I, as a teacher, cannot teach. So I cannot pay individual attention, so I'm paying money. But the question is, in the era of analytics and Google Sense, in the, is there any place for wisdom, wisdom movement? Is there any way for... Wisdom, wisdom movement. For wisdom, <laughs> for wisdom to win. It sometimes seems uh, that these days, wisdom has a hard time of it. And is at a disadvantage. And part of what we're trying to do is to Point summon a kind of the collective wisdom of democratic deliberation to address one of the big questions of our time. The young man just here at the front. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, so you began with the example of uh, prisoners getting a better chamber inside the prison on payment of a certain sum. Uh, don't you think sir, it will be a positive step if this is uh, adopted by other nations as well? Because the upkeep of prisoners is something the burden of which falls on the taxpayer and these prisoners are not working. So if they are made to pay, the state is generating some profits and revenues and uh, taxpayers' money can be used for the benefit of taxpayers themselves instead of uh, using it for prisoners who are anyway uh, unwanted parts of society. Well, uh, there, there is a fiscal argument in favor of extracting money from prisoners for their keep. And the question is whether that fiscal benefit is outweighed by the uh, by the civic significance of, of equal justice under law, including in, in jails, including in the domain of criminal punishment. So there may be a tension between those two, two goals. Uh, we're going to have to take the final question. Otherwise, um, you, you're talking about prison. There are far worse penalties we'll have to pay if we go over time. But just the young lady uh, that I pointed to, yes, if you'd stand up, please. Yeah. Thank you, great. Perfect. Uh, there was an experiment which was done in Africa, wherein there was high prevalence of malaria in those areas. And uh, to sort of reduce the prevalence of malaria, they incentivized the practice of distribution of mosquito nets. And uh, now the result was not as expected because what happened was eventually when the distribution of mosquito nets stopped, there was, uh, there was, an ins there was a, a growth in the prevalence of malaria in those areas. So my point here is that when you incentivize something, not necessarily it results in uh, better results or as expected results. So incentivization of values, the value was to inculcate in responsibility in the citizens to take care of their own health. That, that purpose was lost. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, they, a short, short time, they could have probably achieved what they wanted to achieve in terms of uh, figures. But uh, in terms okay. of value inculcation, I think it, the meaning was not achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a wonderful example. And actually, I'd be interested in learning more about the details of your example about the malarial mo mosquito nets. What it illustrates is a theme that has run through our discussion, which is incentives work in a way. And economists say one of the first maxims of economics these days, emblazoned in the textbooks, is is that people respond to incentives. They do, but in ways more complicated and more morally complicated than those economics textbooks often assume. When the money is being paid, when the incentives are being offered, there may be an increase in the number of mosquito nets used or in the number of books those kids read. But we have to ask not only about the short-term effect, that can be measured quantitatively, but also about the longer term effect that reflects the changed attitudes that introducing market reasoning may work on, on the participants. And 
the more we are learning about these paradoxical effects of markets and market reasoning, whether to do with reading books or using mosquito nets, the more I think we are reminded that economics is not a value-neutral science. It's bound up with attitudes, with teaching and learning, and with moral and civic questions that we all as democratic citizens need to deliberate about, argue about. I think that will make for a better, richer economics, but also for a better kind of democratic citizenship. Thank you all. I actually can't think of a better way to end. Um, those of you who have enjoyed this, um, you will be delighted to know that Michael's book is in the bookstore and he will be around to sign books after this session. Um, please join with me Michael Sa and thank Michael Sandel. That was wonderful. Thank you. Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Sandel will be available for book signing next to Full Circle Bookstore.